Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about primary myelofibrosis. This is an overview and introduction. Primary myelofibrosis is a type of myeloproliferative disorder. Remember that there are three classic myeloproliferative disorders, and these include polycythemia rubra vera, essential thrombocythemia, and primary myelofibrosis. So with primary myelofibrosis in particular, it is characterized by clinical proliferation of myeloid cells with variable morphological maturity and hematopoietic efficiency. Let's look at the normal and compare it to primary myelofibrosis. So normal, we have bones that contain bone marrow. This bone marrow mostly are found in flat bones in adults and contain hematopoietic stem cells. These stem cells have the potential to become any blood cell type in our body. For example, the hematopoietic stem cells can become white blood cells, red blood cells, or megakaryocytes, which subsequently become platelets. These three cells are very different in function and serve completely different purposes in our body. The bone marrow and cell differentiation has to work properly in order to produce these red blood cells, white blood cells, and megakaryotes. Some people can develop primary myelofibrosis due to some factors, but mainly the exact cause is unknown. Primary myelofibrosis is myelofibrosis that is not secondary to another disease. Primary myelofibrosis is a myeloproliferative disorder on its own. A lot of people with primary myelofibrosis are asymptomatic, about 30%, but the majority of these people who are asymptomatic have splenomegaly, enlarged spleen, or hepatomegaly, enlarged liver. And we will see why this happens as we go along in the video. In myelofibrosis, what we see is fibrosis occurring in the bone marrow, the area where hematopoietic stem cells usually differentiates and become our blood cells. Within the fibrotic bone marrow, there are there is an increase in fibroblasts, which means that there is an increase in collagen formation and deposition, and also a type 3 collagen, also known as reticulin. The proliferation of fibroblasts and the deposition of collagen is actually a result of hyperplasia of megakaryocytes in the area. Remember that megakaryocytes are the cells that produce and eventually release platelets. There is also proliferation of blood vessels, angiogenesis, and also osteosclerosis, which is because of the increase in activity of osteoblasts, the bone building cells in the area. What is not shown here is also the proliferation of neutrophils that also contribute to the fibrotic transformation of the bone marrow. Keeping these bone marrow fibrotic changes in mind, let us focus now on the pathophysiology of myelofibrosis. And it is quite an amazing story. So here is the same person who has primary myelofibrosis. Here is his liver and spleen on the left, below the diaphragm. In primary myelofibrosis, there is bone marrow fibrosis with cellular abnormalities within the bone marrow. The etiology or cause of these changes is not exactly known, but, however, there are several factors that have been identified. For example, there are chromosomal abnormalities that are found up to 60% of cases. A common example is a mutation of the retinoblastoma gene, for example. Another common finding is a JAK2 mutation, with or without the STAT mutation. Now, the JAK2 STAT mutation is a signaling pathway 
within cells that essentially allows the cells to proliferate and to survive. A common feature of primary myelofibrosis found in the bone marrow is megakaryocyte growth and abnormal hyperplasia of these cells. And there are many causes of this. Some ideas include thrombopoietin receptor mutation or overexpression of thrombopoietin itself. Thrombopoietin is a hormone, a factor which stimulates megakaryocyte development and therefore stimulates platelet production. Platelets are also known as thrombocytes. Finally, these abnormal megakaryocytes and the other cells within the bone marrow with the JAK2 mutation can begin releasing cytokines abnormally. And this is unnecessary. These cytokines can include growth factors which recruit things such as fibroblasts and stimulate fibroblasts to proliferate and thus cause deposition or formation of collagen, turning the area into a fibrotic tissue, causing the hallmarks of primary myelofibrosis, that is bone marrow fibrosis. Because the bone marrow becomes fibrotic and because of the abnormal cells in the area, the bone marrow is unable to keep up with the production of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. As a result, the hematopoietic cells migrates to other organs. The liver and the spleen take over the role of hematopoiesis. When hematopoiesis occurs outside the bone marrow, this is called extramedullary hematopoiesis. As a result of hepatic hematopoiesis, you get hepatomegaly. Similarly, as a result of splenic hematopoiesis, you get splenomegaly. The liver and spleen are essentially compensating for the fibrotic bone marrow. Again, as a consequence of myelofibrosis, hematopoietic stem cells may migrate to the liver and spleen. A note about the spleen. The spleen can grow so big it extends to the left costal margin of the ribs and even further and extend towards the pelvic brim. The spleen enlarges and it can actually compress the structures nearby, such as the stomach, which is right next to it. Because the spleen compresses the stomach, it can cause early satiety. Splenomegaly can undergo small infarctions and irritate the surrounding tissue, causing left upper quadrant pain. Splenomegaly may also cause abdominal discomfort and a dragging sensation. Splenomegaly can cause thrombocytopenia in later stages of the disease and also sequestration and destruction of red blood cells. This is one of the contributors of anemia seen in people with myelofibrosis. But there are actually many other causes of anemia in myelofibrosis. For example, the bone marrow fibrosis and cellular abnormality can lead to reduction in medullary erythropoiesis, which can contribute to anemia. Further, the extramedullary hematopoiesis can be ineffective and not produce enough red blood cells or what not, and this will subsequently contribute to anemia. Going back to the bone marrow fibrosis, as mentioned, you get abnormal medullary hematopoiesis, which contributes to anemia. But this abnormal medullary hematopoiesis can also lead to leukocytosis or leukopenia, so increase in leukocytes or decrease in leukocytes. It can also cause thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia, so a lot of platelets or reduced number of platelets. Thrombocytopenia is more of a common feature in late stage of the disease. The abnormal, the abnormal medullary hematopoiesis means that there will be more abnormal cells being produced. And this means that more cells will be destroyed and so there will be an increase in cell turnover. 
This increase in cell turnover means that there will be an increase in things such as uric acid from DNA, which can lead to gout and urinary stone formation. As well, the increase in cell turnover means an increase in lactate dehydrogenase. Thus, these findings, uric acid and lactate dehydrogenase, are markers in myelofibrosis. The ineffective extramedullary hematopoiesis, together with the sequestration of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in the spleen, contribute to splenomegaly, but also lead to leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and an increase in overall cell turnover, leading again to mentioned earlier an increase in metabolites such as lactate dehydrogenase and uric acid. Bone marrow fibrosis and cellular abnormality can cause pain once it involves the periosteum, which contains pain nerve fibers. Let's go to the other side now and talk about the liver. Hepatomegaly. Remember, hepatomegaly is a common feature in myelofibrosis, a result of extramedullary hematopoiesis. With an enlarged liver, there can be portal hypertension. Portal hypertension leads to a few things. It causes esophageal and gastric varices, which can lead to gastric bleeding and thus contribute to anemia when you lose blood. Portal hypertension can also lead to hepatic encephalopathy in later stages. Portal hypertension can also cause ascites, which can predispose one to spontaneous bacterial infection of the peritoneum. When the bone marrow cannot perform hematopoiesis properly, extra medullary organs take over the job, as mentioned. Now, extramedullary hematopoiesis is very interesting. The spleen and the liver are usually responsible for the majority of extramedullary hematopoiesis when the bone marrow fails. But the lymph nodes can also do this, leading to lymphadenopathy. What's crazy is that the lungs and pleura can also perform hematopoiesis which may lead to pleural effusion and pulmonary hypertension. Parts of the gastrointestinal tract and the genitourinary tract can also do this. What's mind-blowing is that the thalamus, the brain area, and other parts of the brain can also perform hematopoiesis if it needs to. Knowing the pathophysiology of primary myelofibrosis. The clinical presentation, therefore, can include fatigue, which is seen in a majority of cases, 60%, and this is due to anemia. The signs and symptoms can also include splenomegaly, seen in up to 50% of patients, hepatomegaly, pruritus, pulmonary hypertension. It's also important to note that hypermetabolic state or constitutional signs can also be seen, including fever, bone pain, night sweats, and weight loss. The risk factors for primary myelofibrosis is radiation exposure, industrial solvent exposure, including benzenes and toluene, also, age greater than 65 is a risk factor. Primary myelofibrosis is a disorder on its own. However, there is also secondary myelofibrosis. And secondary myelofibrosis is caused by another disease or disorder. A common cause for secondary myelofibrosis is the other myeloproliferative disorders. 30% of polycythemia rubravera can lead to secondary myelofibrosis, as well as a high percentage of essential thrombocythemia can also lead to secondary myelofibrosis. 
someone presents with signs and symptoms suggestive of primary myelofibrosis and other hematological diseases, a full blood count needs to be performed, which will reveal anemia, hemoglobin less than 10 grams per deciliter. It can go as low as 8. A blood smear is performed, a peripheral blood smear, and in myelofibrosis will show nucleated red blood cells, which is abnormal, as well as teardrop-shaped red blood cells, also known as dacrocytes. A side note, dacro comes from the Greek word which relates to tears or the lacrimal ducts. Anisocytosis means red blood cells of unequal size, which is also a feature seen in myelofibrosis. Investigations including full blood count may show leukocytosis or thrombocytosis or leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia or low levels of platelets in the blood is usually signs of later stage of the disease. Other blood investigations look for non-specific abnormalities. These include liver function tests which show an increase in alkaline phosphatase. There can also be an increase in lactate dehydrogenase because of the increase in cell turnover. Electrolyte urea creatinine can show increase in uric acid because of the increase in cell turnover. There can be also increase in vitamin B12 levels which reflects the increase in neutrophil mass. Another investigation in primary myelofibrosis is checking for CD34. CD34 cell count is increased in some primary myeloproliferative patients. Also, the JAK2 mutation is found in about 50% of primary myelofibrosis. Important note to make here is that JAK2 mutation is a common feature of most of the classic myeloproliferative disorders. Bone marrow examination is very important part of investigating and helps in diagnosing myelofibrosis. There are three bone marrow investigations, bone marrow aspiration, bone marrow biopsy, and bone marrow imaging using MRI. Bone marrow aspiration can be initially performed. Bone marrow aspiration essentially is aspirating things from the bone marrow, typically done on the pelvic bone. However, bone marrow aspiration is not diagnostic, and performing the bone marrow aspiration results in a dry tap. It's a dry tap because of the fibrotic tissue in the bone marrow, which leads to nothing coming out. Bone marrow biopsy, on the other hand, helps in diagnosing myelofibrosis. The bone marrow biopsy is necessary to demonstrate fibrosis. Here is a biopsy needle which is being drilled into, through the bone, and into the bone marrow. It is then used to obtain bone marrow tissue for histological examination. The final bone marrow investigation includes imaging, for example using an MRI. The diagnosis of myelofibrosis is based on the World Health Organization criteria in 2008 and need to include most of the following listed. One, a bone marrow biopsy which shows megakaryocyte proliferation as well as collagen and reticulin deposition throughout. JAK2 or MPL mutation. There can be leukoerythroblastosis, signs of anemia, or an increase in lactate dehydrogenase, a palpable splenomegaly, and other differential diagnosis has to be ruled out. Not all of this have to be met in order to diagnose primary myelofibrosis, but majority needs to be met.